Hey guys, Basement Horrors here, and today I'm going to tell you five chilling tales about some of North America's most infamous monsters. You're not safe. These creatures live in all regions. From the Wendigos of the Northern Forests, of the Atlantic Coast and Great Lakes, of the United States and Canada, to Skinwalkers of the Southwest. Even the creature known as the Rake has been spotted coast to coast. So make sure your doors and windows are shut tight and locked. And remember, don't speak about them, because it only draws them nearer. Number one. When I was young, I often spent parts of summers with my grandma in her home out in the country. It was my favorite place in the world, and I always looked forward to the week-long stays of gardening, baking, late-night fires with s'mores and ghost stories, and enjoying having my grandmother all to myself. There was a pond not far from her house where I would sometimes go to swim. It was home to quite a few frogs, and at night they made the most incessant noises. I complained to my grandmother only once, saying that I couldn't enjoy the night breeze with all that racket. She took me on her lap and told me a story about an old man and woman who lived near a lake. The old man couldn't stand the singing of the frogs, but his wife told him that they kept the wind to go away, and to harm them would be unwise. Well, he didn't listen and set about methodically catching all the frogs on the lake. It was a process that took some time, but he didn't stop until he had to rid the lake of the pesky amphibians. That night, without the protection of the frogs, he and his wife were slaughtered by the wendigo, a vicious whip-like creature with elongated fingers ending in razor-sharp talons and rows of silver teeth as thin and keen as needles. I wrote it off as another one of her ghost stories, though she seemed more serious than usual about it. I never complained about the frogs again, mostly because I grew to enjoy them and put the story out of my mind. In fact, I'd forgotten all about it until it came up this past spring in a Native American literature class I was taking in college. The mention of the Wendigo sparked that old memory of my grandmother's story. I thought she'd made up the word. I didn't realize there were stories about it originating in Algonquin legends. Eager to connect something from my childhood to the topic, I googled it only to find that my grandmother had apparently been mistaken. There was nothing I could find about her story, and there was no references of frogs providing protection from the Wendigo. In fact, the Wendigo of the legend seemed to be very little like my grandmother's version. They were said to be unsatiable, craving human flesh, and sometimes created from the forms of people who had resorted to cannibalism to survive. Descriptions varied, but they all sounded almost nothing like my grandmother's boogeyman. I actually chuckled as I read it, a little bit embarrassed by how badly my grandmother had messed up the original tale. I changed my residence this summer, moving to a newly built 1,000 square foot on each side duplex on the edge of town. The other side is to be occupied by my landlady, who had built the place. However, she isn't scheduled to move the rest of her stuff in and begin living there for a couple of weeks. She's waiting for her lease to end. Even though my new place is only a few minutes from the edge of town, it feels much more isolated. I enjoy the seclusion of my new home and its proximity to a more natural setting. I'm surrounded by woods from my, and from my patio, I can even see a pond beyond the carefully landscaped lawn, which is meticulously carved out from the surrounding woodlands. Just like the pond near my grandma's house, the frogs have put up a furious racket lately. I prefer not to run my air conditioning if I can help it, so I have every window open to catch a breeze. That means that I can hear them as clearly as if I were standing on the edge of the water. It took a few days to get used to, but I'm fine now. Just like I was those summers when I was young. In fact, the noise has been comforting to me during the stress of the move. Tonight is different. I find myself standing in my living room, staring at where the pond is, though I can't see it in the dark. The air is eerily still and oppressively warm, but my windows are all shut and I feel impossibly cold. I'd long since convinced myself that my grandmother's story had been a silly tale, a twisting of an old legend by irrelevant storytellers. But for some reason, I have an overwhelming sense of dread growing in the pit of my stomach. I don't know what to do. I'm trapped. Leaving my house means braving the darkness beyond my home, but I don't know if I'm going to be safe in here either. The frogs have stopped singing. Number two, 
I was spending a month with my cousins at my grandma's house. It was August, and my cousins' ages ranged from 10 to 15. I was the oldest, being 15. I was staying with the 10, 13, and 14 year old. We stayed up telling scary stories often, but one night a few weeks in, we decided to make a campfire out back. My grandma's house is in a rural suburb. The neighbors aren't too far when you're driving down her road, but in the backyard, it's a thick forest with man made paths through it. Each house is on a hill, so only part of the basement was actually underground. That isn't important until later, though. So, we're towards the east side of her yard, in a smallish patch of open land. You couldn't see the neighboring yards from here. And there's probably about three quarters of a mile on each side of us that belonged to my grandma. It was maybe 11 at night, and we were playing truth or dare after telling scary stories. And my 14-year-old cousin dared me and the 13-year-old to go walk through the paths for 10 minutes or so. I said yes right away, as I wasn't easily scared and rather level-headed. But my younger cousin was a bit more hesitant. We didn't bring a flashlight because it wasn't pitch dark yet, and we could see enough to not die. We were walking through the paths for about 5 minutes and could barely see the fire through the trees when we decided to turn. In the middle of the path, was a large dog-like creature, hunched over with its front hands an inch from the ground. What I remember most was how its eyes were so bright white, and it was humanoid dog-shaped with a human-like head, but dog-like body with human hands and feet. It looked right at us, and I know that I was paralyzed with fear as it dashed away the opposite direction from us, towards the creek that ran through the yard. Eventually, my cousin and I screamed bloody murder, and the other cousins of my grandma ran to us. I don't remember much because I was really disoriented and I couldn't think properly, but I did wake up in bed, so I assumed that I was brought up to the house. All the kids all the kids slept in the basement, in a really big room with sliding glass doors to the outside, as the room was on the side that was underground. My bed was pressed against the big glass window and I could see my cousins playing outside down below. The house is in Michigan, so it gets slightly chilly even in the end of August, and there was a slight breeze, so I put on a jacket and ran to join them outside, skipping breakfast, not wanting to miss out on anything fun. When I got down, I could tell that they weren't playing, but rather running to get my grandma. Her dogs, both of them, were dead, ripped up. That night, we went to bed early, I woke up at maybe 2 in the morning because I felt something hit my head. My cousins were all sitting on the double bed opposite me on the other side of the room. There was one bunk bed and two double beds, the double beds for me and my 14 year old cousin. They were being quiet and staring at me. The 13 year old nodded his head towards the window and I froze, they all looked afraid. I turned my head slightly to the side and saw a really messed up looking face pressed to the window with gaping eyes looking down at me. I screamed so loud and it bolted. I called my grandma and she called the police after I told her what happened and they, they found nothing. I went home after that and I've never been back there during the night. Number three, I decided to join my bestie Karen for a three day stay at her grandmother's place on the res. Her grandmother lives near a place called Tuba City, Arizona in the middle of nowhere, but surrounded by rural homes. We go to college together, and I was kind of interested to know about Navajo tradition. The first day we stayed, it was pretty chill. Nothing out of the ordinary, but then her grandma, who's not that old, only around 67, said that a stray dog came out of nowhere and wouldn't leave. To me, it did act kind of strange and was ugly looking. It was black with a shaggy coat, and it looked like a mix between a German Shepherd and a Lab. That night, we were watching a movie in the living room that had big windows that looked out into the front where the cars were parked, nothing fancy. The curtains were wide open, and Grandma was in the kitchen cooking dinner, and we were in them watching a movie. Next to the window is a bookshelf where all the DVDs are kept. Karen went to put the DVD back we just watched, but she freaked out because that stray black dog was staring at us through the window, standing on top of the wood box outside. Not something normal dogs do from my point of view, or hers. Usually my dog, which is a house dog, scratches the door to be let in. 
Res dogs aren't house dogs, and dogs inside homes are frowned upon in Navajo tradition. They are meant to protect the house and the owner. The other dogs seem to stay away from it. Karen opened the door and yelled at it to get off the box, and it ran behind the shed. We went to Tuba City to get some groceries and came back to the house. The dog was nowhere to be seen, so nothing unusual. Grandma had went to go visit some people, so it was just Karen and I. About 5 o'clock, we heard someone trying to open the door. Both of us looked out since there had been no car heard and no dogs barking. Looking at the living room window of the door, there was the dog trying to open the door with its paws. Two paws wrapped around the brass doorknob, standing on its hind legs. I thought that was weird, but wasn't really freaked out. Karen was. She opened the door and chased it off. Later, when Grandma came back, Karen told her. Grandma didn't like what she heard. We got ready to sleep, and we slept in the spare bedroom since it had two beds. One window with curtains opened a little. We turned off the light, but there was a sound coming from the top of the roof. Pitter-patter footsteps, and scratching sounds, and panting. It then sounded like it jumped off onto the large plastic water barrel they had. At first, we heard it sounded like barking. But as it grew louder, the other dogs seemed to be barking at something also. But all of a sudden, something was running around the house, barking, and it was the dog. No. Nope. It, it wasn't. This barking sounded human. A deep male voice barking like it knew that we knew it wasn't a dog. Woof. 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 Just exactly like that, adding the W's, R's, and A's. Then panting again by the window, and we started freaking out. Karen decided to, in my opinion was stupid, open the curtains to look out. There was a stray dog on its hind legs looking into our bedroom, but this time it stunk, and what I thought were two black holes in the neck were another pair of eyes twinkling. Think of those ugly glossy spider eyes staring at you. And the paws were deformed looking hands with overgrown, somewhat thick and sharp fingernails. Again, both screaming and shutting the curtains closed. Grandma came running through the door and seeing it. First thing she did was grab ashes from the fireplace, load three shells and her shotgun from under her bed, bless herself in Navajo, and went outside to shoot it, yelling in Navajo about how the thing wasn't welcome there and how to get out of there for it to go linger somewhere else. Them both being traditional, the next day they called a medicine man to come over and put cedar in. He prayed over everyone with cedar smoke and an eagle feather bust the place, and made us eat bitter herbs, called Eagle's Goal or something, and he gave me an arrowhead. Apparently, I needed to carry one for protection and a little pouch called a corn pollen. Seems to work pretty well. The medicine man said the dog was a skinwalker, which in Navajo is a long word, but I could just call them Yoshis. The body of a stray dog, which was killed by the skinwalker, made an illusion so we wouldn't know it wasn't a real dog. He said that the Yoshis tend to harm people by using some sort of human bone straw to spit at someone. Think spitballs, only deadlier. And get humans bone, human bones into them. Doctors can't detect it, but the medicine men that day pulled a piece of human skull out of Grandma's right shoulder. Pretty big. About two inches long and one centimeter th thick. It was real because we watched him pull it out of her. That was intense. Number four, I'm female, using a throwaway account and posting this here because I don't care if anyone believes me or not. It's a story, my story, and it's nice to finally sit down and tell someone about it, even if you are just some random stranger on the internet. Growing up, my home life wasn't ideal. I won't go into some sob story, but it was bad enough to warrant involvement from authorities on multiple occasions. You would think that I would have been taken away from my mom, but our ju judicial system is pretty messed up. My mom and whatever boyfriend she had at the time were always careful to not let my outward well-being stray too close to concerning. Some part of me thinks that she only wanted, to, wanted me and my brother because of government assistance. One winter, when I was about six, our gas was shut off due to bills not being paid. My mom's solution was to add a single blanket to my bed and dress me in long sleeves and sweatpants. I complained that my nose and ears were too cold, but she told me to sleep with the covers over my face. It's difficult to remember all the details because I blocked out most of my childhood and adolescence, but 
I remember a pretty bad snowstorm coming in one night. The house was already freezing, so I begged my mom to let me stay with my older brother, but she declined. That night was so cold that I was kept awake but by my, con my constant shivering. When my mom got me up that morning, school still hadn't been canceled, but I think... But I think my complaining made her worry that I would end up saying something to a teacher, so I was kept home. As a kid, I was overjoyed by the idea of a snow day. Where we lived, snow was pretty common, so it usually took a blizzard to get school shut down. I always saw snow days on TV, though, and was enthralled by them. I was an odd kid, and almost felt like my first year of school wouldn't be complete without at least one snow day. My brother still had to go to school which made me worry that my dreams of playing outside would be short-lived. Luckily for me, my mom could only stand having me around for short periods of time, so she bundled me up and practically hurled me into the snow. I didn't care, though, as I was a bit of a wild child, usually pretty hyperactive and very independent, probably because of neglect. Behind our house was an area of thick woods. If you followed the path through it, you would reach another housing area, much nicer than our own. If you happened to go off the path, straying diagonally, you would end up on a forest reserve. For this reason, my mother let me, never let me near anywhere, anywhere near the woods. As I was playing in the snow, I suddenly recalled that an older boy lived in the house almost directly across from mine. I knew this because earlier that year, I had gone against my mother's wishes, went through the woods, and ended up in his backyard. He had a swing set, interesting action figures, and snacks. I don't know what compelled me but I suddenly had the desire to go see if he was home. Like I said, I was six at the time and my thoughts weren't always coherent. This is where my already foggy memory becomes even hazier. I find myself trying to recall everything, but it all comes jumbled, like it was more of a quick dream. I found the path, took one look at my house to draw a mental line across the woods, and then I was alone. The snow started to fall again, and the heat, had maintained, the heat I had maintained while playing had started to fade away. I should have been more worried, but ignorance is bliss when you're a child. I don't know if it was because the trees were blocking out the light, but I remember the light dimmed around me and I heard someone calling my name. At first, I called back my own name, feeling like it was some sort of game. The voice got closer to me, and this sounds weird, but I wanted to play hide and seek with whoever it was. My mom had never had this stranger danger talk with me, so I assumed that if they knew my name, then they must be friendly. I don't think I even hesitated before I took off in the opposite direction of the voice. Off the path. I don't remember where I hid, but I do remember that it was dark, but I could still see out into the woods. It may have been a small cave or hollow, or a very dense tree with its branched way down to the ground. The voice changed. It still called my name, but it didn't sound human anymore. A fact that didn't bother me in the slightest. I knew I had picked a really good hiding spot in that I was almost excited at the idea of being found by whoever it was. Soon, it stopped calling my name and instead started making oop sounds. I remember the sound. It's kind of like an elk slash bird combo. I could hear it getting closer and closer, and as it did, my excitement grew. Right when it was, sounded like it was just a few yards away from me, it stopped. I waited and waited, but nothing ever came. I felt disappointment rush through my little body, but just as I felt completely drained, a loud up came from directly behind me. I'm not sure if I looked behind me, but I do remember running out of my hiding place laughing and giggling. I ran through the snow and trees again and found a new hiding place. In the distance, I heard sound coming from my old hiding place and knew that it was coming. I'm not sure how long this went on, but it was dark by the time I heard my brother calling and saw his flashlight bobbing towards me. For a long time, I believed that I'd still been in a state of play when he found me, but years later I asked, and he said very surprised that he even remembered, that I'd been curled up next to a log, half frozen. I didn't say anything to him, and I creeped him out quite a bit, because I kept saying, I kept making weird noises the whole way home and throughout that night. Even my mom spanking me and berating me, my only response was an oh up. Most of my memory goes blank after that night, but according to my brother, I became a holy terror. I started throwing fits if my mom ever did something I didn't like, and I was known for saying or doing some pretty disturbing things. For example, when I was about eight, my new stepdad was passed out on the couch and I told my brother in detail 
how easy it would be to skin him alive. Things got worse and worse till my strange behavior could no longer be tolerated at school. Teachers had, I guess, always been suspicious of my mother, but they never had much to go on. Social workers, even before that night, had been called to my home to check out things because it had always been, but because it had always been cleanish, and we had always had food, they didn't have anything to go on. That all changed when I was sent to see a therapist of some kind. I really don't remember. At first, I wouldn't talk to him, but then they brought in my brother, and I unloaded. It's not something I can get my brother to talk about readily, but he said that I didn't seem like myself, though everything I said changed our lives forever. No sob story or two personal details, but my mom was not a good woman. She was far worse than anyone could have suspected. I don't know how, but the biological father of my brother was tracked down. He was only 17 when our mom got pregnant, and he'd been around for a few months after my brother's birth, but she'd started dating another guy, left him, and took my brother. Being 17 and admittedly stupid, he just let her walk off with his son. She never even asked for child support. He had already been married and divorced by the time child services found him, and I think that that may have been why he agreed to not only take in my brother, but me as well. The divorce had left him feeling like his life was hollow and meaningless. He often says that we gave him meaning. As kind as he is, I never really bonded with him, not like my brother did. He's always given me all the love I could ever want, but I have trouble accepting it. Childhood trauma and neglect has left me rather cold towards that kind of stuff. We had to move to another state to live with him, which really agitated me as a kid. That, coupled with constant therapy, often left me feeling isolated. All through my teen years, I admit that I was a bit sullen and purposely difficult, which I feel terrible for now. My only thoughts were to get away from my ultra-loving home and back to the home that caused me so much mental scarring. Just the house, mind you. I didn't want to return to my mother. The need was so great that I made plans to move back to attend the college located a few towns over from my hometown, which is where I am now. Once I was away from my family, I was finally able to put into perspective how much love my adopted father had exhibited in taking us in. We were finally able to establish a much more meaningful, much deeper bond once he was at a distance. I thought about going back home. The college there is much better, but each time I thought about it, the image of those woods would flash into my mind. Last December, while on break, I decided to head down and take a look. For all I knew, the wooded area may have been filled up by housing, but it, it wasn't. I didn't even have to pull up my old house in Google Map. It felt like I was just led there. My old neighborhood had gone to crap. Well, it's crappier than it had been. The house I grew up in was completely boarded up, as were most of them on the street. That was actually very happy. I was actually very happy to see that though. It meant that I could more easily access the yard, more specifically the still unfenced backyard. As an adult, it was much more frightening to trudge through the snow up to the forest that was much darker than I remembered. It took a few long minutes of sucking myself up before I was able to step out onto the path that was still there. Once I was far enough in, the memory of playing hide and seek came flooding back with way more clarity than I'd ever had. For the first time, I was putting into perspective the fact that I'd been playing with some unknown creature in some godforsaken dark creepy forest. I thought about noping out of there, but as I turned back I heard it. A wop. Every hair in my body stood on end as I came close to peeing my pants. I could feel my cheeks beginning to heat up, and some sort of fearful, fearful blush, and my eyes began to water. I turned back around and hurriedly walked down the path. In the back of my mind, I haphazardly wondered if that boy still lived in that house, and the idea of seeing him, and the idea of seeing if he was home, seemed like a very good plan. I didn't want to run though. I felt like running would only cause whatever it was to chase me. That thought quickly went out the window though, as I heard the sound directly behind me, and felt a warm breath on the back of my neck. I didn't look back. I ran, occasionally slipping and sliding on the slick, thin layer of snow. The path, mu the path must have changed because. I soon found myself at a dead end. There were a cluster of trees that I don't remember being there, and the path faded away between them. In a panic, I thought that maybe they had grown over the path, so I stripped around them. The, near the tree nearest me rustled, and from somewhere inside it, something whispered my name. The voice was cracked, somewhat human, but it was more like what you would imagine an animal would sound like if it could talk. 
I didn't even care about following the path at that point. I took off in a direction that looked to have less trees, hoping it would be a way out. I was wrong. Instead, I found a dirt hill with a steep drop off and on the inside, most directly in front of me, was a little cave slash hollow. I knew what it was immediately, my first hiding spot from the game of hide and seek, and there was something inside. I couldn't make out what it was, but I knew it had antlers and it was crouching very much like a human would. So much fear ran through me that it took my breath away, and I stood there for a moment in stunned silence. I vaguely thought of, about how this thing was going to kill me, and how it would probably be worse than any horror movie I'd ever seen. Then, I heard it call my name. With the same, ver with the same voice I heard in the tree, it shocked me into action, and I ran alongside the hill until I found a way up that wasn't too steep. At a distance, somewhere behind me, I heard the call, and at that point, I finally started to cry. Somehow, don't ask how, I finally spotted a break in the trees and barreled out into the direct sunlight and the boys' backyard. That part didn't register at first. It didn't click until I was banging on the back sliding door and his mom showed up, looking more terrified than I. She stood there staring at me with wide eyes. I thought about how insane I was going to sound and how insane I must look. What do you want? She called out through the door. Does that kid live, still live here? I panted stupidly. Uh, I, I lived across the way. I wanted to uh, see if he was here. Thought I uh, heard wolves. Don't go. I won't go into too much details because this is way too long. But she almost called the cops, decided against it, and allowed me to leave my number for him. As I was about to take my very long walk around the woods to my car, I guess she took pity on me and offered me and offered to drive me. I was lucky because even driving, it took about 20 minutes to get around the long strip and back to my old neighborhood. During the ride, she remarked that she didn't remember me being one of her son's friends. I explained that. I wasn't really his friend, just a random girl that, that had met him after trekking through the forest one summer. When I told her this, she turned a shade of whitish green and gave me a funny look. My son, she explained slowly, was convinced in his early teens that there was a ghost girl that lived in the forest with the creature and would go on and on about how she would come and stand outside his window and talk to him at night. He said she was a girl he had previously met and had died in the forest. Wasn't sure how to respond to that. To my knowledge, I hadn't gone back into the forest after that first incident. Then again, I don't remember much of what happened after that night. So I was honest and explained that I had PTSD with most of my memory being blacked out. This time she turned a new shade of pale and asked why I had PTSD. I explained, but it seemed like she already knew why, and I think it clicked who I was. I was in administrations in the high school here. We heard about you and what happened. The rest of the ride went very quietly. She dropped me off in my car, said her goodbyes, and left. For a long time as the sun was setting, I sat in my car and watched the edge of the forest. Had I really been going out there as a kid? A little girl some, with some creature? Why didn't I remember any of this? I can't explain the feeling that came over me, but it was calming. If all that was true, then whatever it was had never harmed me. The whole ride home, I was pretty zoned out, so I missed multiple text messages I received from an unknown number turned out to be that guy, who was very keen on the idea of seeing if I was the ghost girl from his teens. He went on to join the sheriff department, and on the side, wait for it, he does ghost hunting. We texted back and forth for a few days before I finally agreed to meet up with him. He almost passed out when he first saw me, but then he started to pick up part of my story and appearance, saying that I was probably the same human girl he met, but certainly not his ghost girl. He maintained that attitude till the subject of the woods came up. This guy hunts ghosts. I definitely didn't feel like I would be cr the crazy one if I told him about the, the sounds and the creature. This changed his tune a little bit, but he still maintains that I'm not the same girl. We are now semi-dating. Semi because I'm not very fond of close emotional bonds. And no, he still won't believe me. Since December, I've started meditation in hopes of recalling lost memories, so specifically about the forest. I've been able to recall a few, but they're choppy and hard to follow. I remember talking to something, playing house sometimes, or hide and seek, always at night. I've tried doing research, and the closest, the closest physical description I can think is a wendigo. But the nature doesn't really line up, seeing as those things are supposed to be negative entities. Any ideas? I'm thinking about going back, and probably will. Number 5. I was visiting my grandparents out in Shiprock, New Mexico during last October to see my family 
and to the Northern Navajo Nation Fair that week. Many Navajo people, including my own family, are very reluctant to speak about skinwalkers because it's believed to attract their attention. However, I grew up away from the Navajo Nation and was very naive about the subject. When it came to skinwalkers, I was an absolute skeptic. My mom used to tell me a story about how back in the 80s, when she lived with her siblings and my grandparents, still in Shiprock, but on the southern outskirts, how she and her aunt, she and my aunt, saw a skinwalker just outside their driveway, under a streetlight. She described it as a black dog with dirty fur, a twisted noodle-like front leg, and these unnatural eyes with a soft, burnt orange glow. Me, being my closed-minded self, doubted every word but I never said my doubts out loud. These doubts totally changed last year when I went to my grandparents' house. Me and my family had just finished going to the carnival at the Navajo Nation Fair and called it a night. The house was close enough to where we could walk home in just 10 minutes, so we did. When we got there, it was about nine at night where we stayed up until about two catching up on family affairs and the local news. It was during that time that I just decidedly opened my mouth and blurted out the question. Hey, are skinwalkers real? Guys? I asked. You shouldn't be speaking about that, my grandma said with an almost disturbed yell in her voice. So she and my grandfather both decided to go to bed. After being scolded by my mom, one of my aunts chimes in in a very cautious tone and says, They're real, alright. Had a few start screaming outside my trailer in Farmington just a few nights ago. Your cousin had nightmares the whole night, and woke up crying that morning. Not wanting to push the discomfort anymore, we all decided to go to bed. Now, the trailer home is pretty old, and it was a really nice night. So, we slept with the windows open, with screens to prevent bugs from coming in. Everyone had drifted off to sleep, except for me, because my mind was still going a million miles a minute about skinwalkers, and wondering if I had ever encountered one while here on the reservation. As a kid, I was told it was taboo to think about skinwalkers because it can call their attention. That's when things hit the fan. Just as I was settling and finally getting relaxed for sleep, I started to hear something moving outside. I got up from the couch and started wandering over to the kitchen window. In the trailer, all of the rooms had the lights out, so the only visible light that can be seen is from the porch light out front. I was thankful for this because I told myself if it really was a skinwalker outside, then hopefully it wouldn't notice me seeing it. So I mustered up the courage and took a quick scan of outside. From the porch light, all I could see is the dusty ground and the vehicles that my family drove, along with some old metal trash cans that stood beside the road. Looking for about a good five seconds, I wasn't able to see anything, so I was getting ready to turn around and walk back to bed, thinking it was just a stray cat or something. Only having taken two steps, I hear what sounded like a distorted scream coming from outside, definitely close by. Fear rising, I look outside again, and there I see it. A coyote-like figure was staring in my direction from behind the cars, just outside of the reach of the porch light. Only it looked awfully wrong. It gave off an evil vibe just from seeing it, and it was gray with very disheveled hair and a horrific orange-red soft glow came from its eyes. I noped out of there and ran back to the bedroom. It was at this moment I began to notice an awful stench in the air that smelled like rotting meat. I started trying to wake my mom, who was like, It's almost 3 a.m. What do you want? I immediately began in a shaken voice. There's something scary outside. Then she said, now annoyed because I woke her up. Ah, uh, it's probably just a stray animal or something. It's the res. Animals wander out all the time at night. She obviously wasn't getting the drift of what I was saying, so I screamed. There's some Blair Witch Project crap going outside, Ma. That got her attention. What? What are you talking about? She said. Then we heard it. The thing outside started making more of its dreadful like screams and started what sounded like thrashing outside in the wall. Hear that? That's what I'm talking about. So both her and I got back up to look outside at the window, and the coyote thing was making its way to the door. It walked with an odd limp and dragged its back right leg, as if it had candy capped. You could hear it start to scratch against the door, and made this odd muffled moaning sound. My mom went and got my dad, 
and they both started shouting in Navajo all sorts of words, telling the thing to go away, and saying that it wasn't welcome there. Well, all this communication was enough to get the rest of the trailer up as they came out to the hallway. The only thing my mom did was turn to them and said, Skinwalker, while proceeding to point to the door, where the noises were still happening. Apparently, they already knew exactly what to do, as my grandfather got out a handgun from a drawer and a bag of ashes. He coated a few bullets and loaded them into the gun and went straight to the door. Yelling out more Navajo that was too fast for me to comprehend, he swung the door open and fired twice. Nothing. The thing managed to escape before my grandpa could put a bullet in it. That's the fastest one I've ever seen, said my grandpa. Next thing you know, my aunts and my parents are freaking out about what just happened and saying stuff like, What if it comes back tomorrow? And, It saw us. Does that mean we're targets now? Afterwards, my grandparents called everyone down, including myself, telling us that we'll be fine and then we all went to bed. Morning comes and my grandparents call one of our neighbors and explain to them what had happened. Apparently one of them was a medicine man and used to partake in Navajo ceremonies used for healing and curing sickness. He came over and blessed each one of us and the grounds outside. Today, I am very convinced that what I saw was a skinwalker. I'm still planning on going back for visits for the family and to the Northern Navajo Nation Fair, which is really fun. I just adamantly hope that I never have such awful experience like that again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know in the comments and also let me know what other types of stories you want to hear. If you really like my stuff, make sure you click on one of the suggestions on the screen. And if you have any personal horror stories or original creepypastas or artwork you want featured on the channel, send them in to basementhorrors at gmail.com. And if you're a fellow narrator and want to be in our Halloween collaboration this year, also send me an email. Thanks so much for watching the video. And until next time, have a horrific day.